Hi, Barbie. Today, yes, we are finally talking about the Barbie movie. You guys, I'm so sorry. This took so long for me to get to. I actually did record it and the sound was unusable and I, I just needed a minute to take a breath and grieve. Cause you know, it's like when the computer eats your paper and you're like, that was the best paper I'd ever written. And it wasn't, but it just was the paper you had already written and you didn't want to write it again. That's okay. We're back. We're going to keep talking. Well, we're going to start over and we're going to start talking about Barbie because listen, if you guys follow me on Instagram, which, which you should, you know, I've been going like ham on Barbie. And I actually, like a few weeks ago, I, my manager was like, you're going to, what Barbie content do you have? I was like, I have nothing. And she's like, have you seen yourself? Blonde, blue eyed, your whole house is pink. In what dimension of time or space, Shall and Lester, do you think you get to opt out of Barbie content? I was like, okay, I'm so sorry. And then it was just like balls to the wall. Not like anybody in Barbie land has balls, but if they did, they would be to the wall. So I've been doing some reels and talking about lessons we can learn from Barbie, all sorts of things. And then I finally was able to see the movie, which, did you guys see it? I loved it. I had very low expectations because like it's a Barbie movie, you know, and I think people nowadays, every movie's got to have a lesson and this and be so politically correct. Bro, what happened to entertainment? It's summer, right? Like last year it was Top Gun summer and the chokehold that mustaches had over Bozeman, Montana and just country people in general, thanks to Top Gun. Wow. I mean... It was mustache summer, but it was like 80s summer. And it was just such a wonderful, entertaining thing. You know, it was a great, wonderful, entertaining movie. I saw it seven times in the theaters, each with a different boy. I was like, do you know what we could do tonight? Um, oh my gosh, I'm just like off the top of my head. Maybe like, what's that movie? Top Gun? <laughs> I'm such a con artist. And then we, is, you know, it gets them all like America and like rowdy and full of testosterone. Like, I'm such a little cinematic grifter. But this year, it was Barbie summer. And I love how last year it was like for the boys. You know, it was like, yeah, like USA. And this year, it was for the girls. And so I was like, that's enough. I don't think that this movie needs to like shatter anybody's identity. I think it can just be fun. It can just be fun candy and shapes and colors and bright pink things. I cried through the whole movie. I mean, I started to cry and I like didn't stop. My mom, I saw with my mom and I'm so glad I got to see her with her. She's like, are you crying? I was like, no, <laughs> I'm getting my period soon. <laughs> but it was just really moving. It was, it, I, it obviously isn't like a sad film. No animals die, if you're wondering, because you know, that'll make all of us cry all the time. It was just, I don't know. It was like this hybrid of nostalgia and like feminism and also my period <laughs> and, you know but that's part of being a woman is you just sort of like micro sob at things you're watching a commercial about like a car and you're like <laughs> okay i'm all right <sighs> do you guys ever do that do you micro sob and it's it's almost like a sneeze but it's a cry it's like a like a sad emotional orgasm that's not fun anyway so today I want to talk a little bit about Barbie and the concept of having it all. What does that mean? What does it mean to be a successful woman? What is success as a woman? Because I think just the fact that I sat here saying, hey, Top Gun, no one expected like all these life lessons from it, but Barbie, God damn it, like she was going to be under a microscope. Ah, doesn't that say it all? Men have such a low bar. And you know, I love men, and this isn't a man-hating video, and I don't think it was a man-hating movie, and Barbie has nothing to fucking do with hating men. She loved men. Her and Ken were boning all the time in my Barbie dream house, right? But I, we can't deny that men don't have to do very much to be considered successful. The whole plot of Ken's storyline in this movie was, what do you mean I don't get to run the world just because I'm a man? I'm, I'm a man, though. I'd like to speak to a doctor. You are speaking to a doctor. <laughs> that was amazing. Where it's like, wait a minute, what do you mean I have to be qualified for something? What do you mean the, the red carpet isn't just rolled out for me? I'm a man. Yeah. 
I think we all understand that dynamic. But before we get started, since we're talking about being glam and girly and getting all dressed up, you guys, it's almost back to school. We're thinking about our fall wardrobe. Check out some words from today's sponsor, a really cool fashion brand I think you guys are gonna like. Check out some of these looks. Hey there, shalligators. You guys know I love my fashion. I'm such a clothes horse. I can be such a hoarder if you let me, but I'm really working towards fewer better things, right? Like not a closet full of just fast fashion garbage outfits because they don't last. They're honestly not flattering and they're just so bad for the environment. Do you know that the number one thing in a landfill is textiles? It's cloth. But I found a company and I wanna show them to you guys because they're kind of an it girl secret. Like they're an elegant it girl secret, Lily Silk. It's a celeb favorite of Gwyneth Paltrow, Anne Hathaway, Gigi Hadid, Lucy Hale, like ladies with style. And this is what I love about the brand. They're super sustainable. They work with this company called TerraCycle to do recycling. They are zero waste. Let me show you some of these looks. I'll show you how I style them and I'm gonna give you some tips on dressing them up or down. Okay. Check out this blue dress. I feel very French starlet in this, and I feel like the whole wide world right now is in the south of France. Do you feel that way? Okay. I love this dress. I think it's so versatile. You can dress it up with little wedges or heels. You can dress it down with flats. Love this look. Very flattering to almost all shapes. And let me show you another blue dress. This dress is a closer. These slip dresses are, you're seeing them all over the place. It's the kind of look that you need to get in quality fabric. And this is actually like very, very affordable. If you get it in that cheap, fast fashion polyester, girl, it doesn't lay right. It clings to all the bumps and lumps on your body. I love this kind of look, a bias cut dress. It's a very classic tailored look because it looks good if you're more like long and, and straight and narrow and noodly, or if you've got like the curves, it truly works on any body type. You can adjust the straps, you can pair it with heels if you want a little bit more lift. Mm. But if you're looking to dress something down, a silk button-up shirt has become a staple of my wardrobe and I never thought I was a button-up girl. But look, you can pair this with cut-off denim. Are these too short? Are they a little too short? They might be. But listen, that goes to show you can wear this out to brunch with heels. You could put it with nice tailored pants for work. You could leave it open with, ooh, with like a lacy bra or a little camisole. Again, because it's a nice fabric, it's gonna lay just right. It's not gonna bunch. You're not gonna sweat in it. That's always fun in the summer. I love this look. Okay, can I show you a style I never thought I would wear? Wide leg pants. I thought this is only for girls who are like 6'2 and above. I'm 5'5 five five on my best day. I actually love this look. And if you are on the shorter, more petite side, you can keep this look from overwhelming you by pairing it with something tighter on top, like a bodysuit, maybe a crop top, ah? You could jazz it up for work, add a blazer. I paired it with heels because I just felt like I needed a little bit of a lift. But honestly, I tried it on with flats after and I think it looks almost better. And I'm gonna show you the next look that you can see with flats. I love this look. I'm very into monochrome. I think this look is great. Like if you wanted to wear a silky cami underneath and put the sweater, which is also by Lily Silk, it's so soft sweater over to wrap it around your shoulders, very preppy. This is a great fall look. I think this is a beautiful winter look. It's something you can really jazz up around the seasons. And that is the point of these classic pieces is you don't wear it once and it's so over the top trendy that people are like, no, we saw it, we saw it. You can pair them with so many things moving forward. They're great for different seasons. They just look timeless because elegance is timeless. You're gonna get a discount code below. And remember, this is so sustainable. It's so versatile, well-tailored, beautiful feeling, beautiful wearing, beautiful for any weather. Go ahead and check them out. And like I said, save with my code. See you later, Shalligators. Okay. I love some of those looks. They're so like out of my wheelhouse. Like I never thought I would wear wide leg pants anyway. Hope you guys enjoy them and I hope you guys uh, have some good shopping. Okay the Barbie movie. I loved it. I loved it. And you know, the criticism from men, like we fucking asked, did you not watch the movie? The irony. The criticism is it's a man hating movie. She hates men. No, she fucking doesn't. And if, if men talk to women the way this movie talks about men, bleh, you do talk to women. <laughs> this way. You talk to women like this all the time, tacitly or overtly. You have laws about our bodies. Okay. You have laws about what we can wear. Women in other countries are still getting their fucking heads chopped off for honor killings because they decided to have a little free will or show that slutty ass ankle. Do you not think that... 
We hear these messages, oh, women, uh, all the time. It is so pervasive, we can't really even funnel it down. And when you try, it's the definition of gaslighting. Oh, okay, so you think your job is holding you back because you're a woman? Oh, this equal pay thing, oh, that's just a myth. Of course, of course there's not a memo that gets sent around. Hey guys, just FYI, we're only paying women uh, 75% of what we're paying men. I can't tell you how many guys in my life are like, that's a myth. And I said, excuse the fuck out of you. First of all, what women have you ever worked with? You're a fucking welder, okay? Shut up, sit down. Second of all, I worked for over a decade in New York City and I was accidentally given my coworker, my male, my male counterparts pay stub, like they put them on your desk. He was making, I think, $12,000 more a year than me. And he did so much less. He was such a piece of shit. He would come to work drunk. He was a man. We had the exact same title. He was a man. This whole equal pay thing, men don't seem to understand. It's like, well, if I'm a doctor and she works at Dairy Queen, why should she make the same as me? Why are you this stupid? Of course that's not what it means. It's equal pay for equal work. Why do we even have to explain this? It's so ridiculous. And I'm sorry. You know, I hear, you know, it's like gay rights and gay men are marching. At the end of the day, you know what gay men are? Men. They're men. They can defend themselves in an alley. They can like, ha ha ha, like ham it up on the golf course with the other guys. They're still men. And we are still second class citizens. So until women have truly equal rights to men, which again, laws about our bodies, we don't. I really don't want to hear about these other groups who are men, who are men, and feel so fucking disenfranchised. Miss me with this. We still have plenty of issues around just regular women that we need to solve before we move into these incredibly niche categories. Well, I'm a non-binary, left-handed, peanut allergy person. No. No, 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 no. And if you try to run that game on me, guess what? I go weird Barbie real fast, real fast. Anyway, <laughs> let us move on. I thought the movie was fantastic. And I think so many of us really latched on to, or the thing that really was just like, oh, tell it, is when America Ferreira, who by the way is clearly on Ozempic, but I'll talk about that in my Ozempic update video that I'm doing in a day or two. When she goes on this, this rant, it's her monologue. She's like, you have to be this, but not too much of that. And you have to be a boss, but not scary. And you have to be a caretaker, but really independent. And I'm like, uh, yeah, tell it girl, tell it girl. I love it. I love to hear this rant. I love to hear this speech. And again, all I was thinking about when I was hearing that is men who are like, oh, but men, no one no one believes that about men. No one has that template for men that they have to be all of these things, all of these things. Did you ever see the movie A Divorce Story? I think that's what it was called. Of course I didn't because what a fucking downer. It was with Scarlett Johansson and Adam Driver and they're just like sad and divorced. Like, <laughs> been done it, okay? I'm, <laughs> I actually don't need to see this parroted back to me on screen. This is not the representation I'm looking for. And I'll touch on representation in a moment. But there's a scene where Scarlett is visiting a divorce lawyer, played by Laura Dern, who's great. And she's talking about how important it is for Scarlett to like present herself as like super mom, you know, in the, in the courtroom and in this custody battle. And she's saying, you know, she said something so interesting. She's like, the concept, like men are held to such a lower standard in terms of being a dad. Like if he's there, wow, he's simply there you know you always see it's like oh my god he's so good with his kids no he's you can take out the word good he's simply with his kids he's just there he provides for him okay he goes to work he's an adult he's supposed to go to work i don't know why this is a brownie point kind of thing but she says something in her monologue in that scene where it's like the concept of a present father is only about 30 years old prior to that men were never supposed to i mean if the bar for what a father should be was incredibly low. They should come home like, hey, Janie, hey, Kyle, <laughs> where's my cocktail? You know, and that's it. And he retreats to the back room. He watches TV, reads the paper. He goes golfing. He doesn't hit them. He pays for things. He, hey, good job, slugger. And that's kind of it. 
this concept of the very involved father is extremely recent, not even in my generation. I'm an elder millennial, <laughs> mid-elder. That it was like, oh, well, that's that's so nice that Mr. Pickett showed up to like help with the soccer game, but oh no, no, it was gonna be Mrs. Pickett who was out there. It was Mrs. Pickett making the signs, Mrs. Pickett driving everyone around. So even the concept of like, oh, women have to be multitudes is historically historic. I mean, that's that is carved into stone. We have to be mothers, we also gotta be like pulling the crops and all this shit. And that's when the role the role was much less complicated than it is now. After the feminist revolution, you can be anything. Oh, really? How many, how many things is that? Oh, <laughs> all of them, actually, all of them. And as time goes on, we're just gonna keep adding more. No, men aren't gonna take anything off your plate. You're still always gonna have to give birth to the baby. And these nipples, they won't be decorative anymore. They're going to be useful. But no, you still have to go to work and have a snapback body, by the way. And it'd be great if you could have a side hustle. Where's that Etsy store, girl? Aren't you making custom tote bags for the Taylor Swift Eras tour? <laughs> what are you doing? And you have to be an amazing friend, a sister. Basically start to parent your parents as they get older and you have to love it. I mean, it's going to be amazing for you when your parents have to go into a nursing home because this is your chance to shine. I could go on. We know this. And even those of us who don't have kids or who don't have a husband, do you not feel the pressure to be a million different things all at once? I do. I only have myself and my coon hound to look after. And I'm still like, huh, it's exhausting. And no one says this to men. No one says this to men. And if they do, wow, the bar is lower. Wow, he showed up. He's babysitting his own kids. You hear that phrase? Makes me want to scratch my eyes out. I will sew my vagina shut rather than have children with somebody who says the phrase, babysitting my children. My own child. We're getting in the weeds. We're getting in the weeds. But you know what? I want to talk about representation a little bit because I touched on that earlier and I did a reel on it. And I said, boldly, representation is overrated. A true alpha doesn't need to see their exact circumstance parroted back to them in the media. First of all, your number one opinion leader is always going to be your parents. That is a psychological fact. And second of all, true champions look around and they don't see people walking their same path. They realize, shit, man, I might have to carve this path myself. And I use the example of my career. When I was a kid, when I was in my 20s even, this, the, being a YouTuber, being an influencer, it didn't even exist. It didn't even exist. So I'm out here in this frontier being like, okay, we're kind of making this up as we go. And I'm doing because I'm following my authenticity. And people are like, you are so racist. And I'm like, when was anyone talking about race? I'm talking about careers. What in hell is wrong with people? Why are people so dumb? I'm talking about careers. God, people. And, but of course, we play the race card. And I'm like, wh why would I be saying you don't need black and Asian Barbies, which I'm not and never came up in the video at all. They already exist. That's not a debate. They exist already. And great, they should. I love it. Whatever. I don't care. I'm talking about Korea. Because Barbie has a million careers, you know? And there's always this thing of like, you know, she's got to represent everyone. No doll represents everyone. It's a doll. I mean, the Cabbage Patch doll, I suppose, is, is quite representative now since all of America is morbidly obese. So where's the backlash there? Anyway, I digress. By the way, did you guys check out on my Instagram my Barbie party that I threw? It was written up by the New York Times. No big deal. <laughs> no big deal. I can't believe that my first mention in the New York Times is about Barbie. I really thought it would include the words indictment and district attorney, but here we are. I will take it. Thrilled. Go check it out. It was an amazing, amazing party. <clears throat> I really leaned in. So here's some things that jumped out to me in the Barbie movie. Some quotes. I wrote them down. Barbie has a... I'll do it in uh, Helen Mirren's voice. Bobby has a great day every day, but Ken only has a great day if Bobby looks at him. I love this because 
we need to be living this. We need to have a great day all the time, regardless of, of men. But we need to make sure that we are throttling men's happiness. <laughs> we need to make sure that we alone decide if a man is happy. <laughs> okay? Fuck equality. People are going to come to this video and be like, you don't want equality. You're goddamn right I don't. And when on earth have I ever said that I did? I don't want to be treated like an equal. I want to be treated much better. Much better. Because life isn't equal for us. Our pay isn't equal. The laws aren't equal. The physical threats we feel aren't equal. Like Barbie says in the movie, oh, I definitely feel an undertone of violence when they're rollerblading down Venice Beach. And Ken's like, people are looking at us. And she's like, uh-huh. There's the difference. There's the difference. The undertone of violence, the constant head on a swivel threat. Do you know why women have such good peripheral vision? Because we are prey. I can see almost, I can see like way behind me right now, and I'm sure you can too. Men, you can always sneak up on a man who's like, huh, because they're, they're hunters, they have tunnel vision. Nothing sneaks up on them. They are the apex predator. We're not. Even biologically, nature is telling us, watch it girl, things aren't equal around here. So forgive the fuck out of me if I misled anyone into thinking I want equality. No, no, no. Only a beta female thinks that. Only a beta female is like, I should pay on the date. <laughs> Girl. Oh, my God. Okay, unless he can suck his own dick. Sure, yeah, split the check. <clears throat> so I love this concept of we need to be depriving men of our attention to throttle their happiness. Why are we giving all this attention to men? What are they giving back to us? If they're giving us attention, if they're enriching our life, Ken wasn't really enriching Barbie's life. He was a bit of a clown. Well-meaning and sweet, I guess. I don't know, but clowny. And so why are we hemorrhaging our energy and our love and our attention towards men? How often do we actually stop and ask ourselves, what the fuck is in this for me? I told you guys, if you're in the, chal if you're in the chalantrage, maybe I mentioned it here. When I was in London a few months ago, there was this boy I met through friends. We had a ton of chemistry. We were like making out at this club. It was so fun. And he's like, oh, I want to take you home. I want to make love to you. And I stopped and I was like, what would be in that for me? And he's like, I, I just want you. I just want you so bad. You're so beautiful. I'm like, oh, I know that. That's what's in it for you. What's in this for me? He had no answer. And the concept of a woman asking what would be in this for me was so foreign. He didn't have a standardized lie ready. Well, baby girl, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to love you forever. Nope. Um, I'm going to get up and we're going to go shopping. <laughs> nope. I've got a 12-inch dick. Mm, very much no. Nothing. The when I was like, what would a woman get out of this experience? <sighs> Bing. Couldn't answer it. I went home. And I thought, why am I not asking this more? Not just of men, but of myself. What am I getting out of this? What am I getting out of letting this guy come over? I get to clean my house. I get to make a goddamn charcuterie board at 10 p.m. because I'm a great hostess. And then I get to give a blowjob. What am I getting out of this? Sex? How valuable is that? Sometimes you're like, oh, it's, it's valuable. Okay. Sometimes it's really not. Like, I don't know that I want to be jostled. I just had Mexican food. I don't want to be shaken up like a two liter Coke bottle. I'm okay. What are we getting out of things? And the fact, again, that this is such a foreign question to a man that they don't even have a lie means it's a foreign question to us because we're not asking. If every woman ha came to the point in the date, it's like, and what will I get out of this situationship, this non-relationship, this actual relationship? Maybe men would start to come up with something. Let me veer into some man love for a minute, though. A quote I loved <clears throat> towards the end of the movie. So in the beginning of the movie, Barbie's like, it's girls night every night. And this is the Barbie dream house. It's not the Ken dream house. And then the roles reverse at the end of the movie. Sorry for the spoilers. And, you know, Ken is like, this is the Mojo Dojo Casa house, not the Barbie dream house. And it's boys night. And she's like, mm. and he's like, see, it's not so fun, is it? How does that feel? And that really struck me, and I really liked that because I think that's very pro-man. It's like, you know, yeah, we can be out here like just shredding men, which I do. And it's like, how would I feel if someone said that to me? 
we have to be able to, to take it if we're dishing it out. And I think there is, we feel so put in a box as women that when we break out, we like break out and we come out swinging, right? I have talked about this so much in therapy. <laughs> Again, if you're in the Chalantrage, which is our little internet cozy corner, it's like our little internet community. You get five videos a week and so much sisterhood. It's amazing. If you are sitting here being like, I'd love to see the movie with my friends, I don't have any friends. Come to Chalantrage, you will make friends. And I promise you, you're going to find them close to where you live. They're, they're doing meetups. People met up in Nashville. I think they're meeting up in Scotland too. So it's great. Anyway, my little my little rant about that. I've talked a lot about how I'm trying to change this pattern that I have in relationships where I'm chill, 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 boom, boom. Like a thing that bothered me at the first chill, like chill, 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 bah! And I, I shoot to kill. I'm sure you can imagine what I'm like when I'm mad. I mean really mad. And when someone's hurt my feelings and they're standing in front of me and I have this whole arsenal of my vocabulary, I cut to the bone, you know? It hurts because it's meant to. And what do I get out of that? Oh, I win. Oh, I've annihilated this man's ego and our relationship. Is that what I'm after? Am I after peace? No, I'm after victory. And they're two completely different things. So I've been really trying to wind that back and be like, hey, I need to bring things up when they bother me so that I can bring them up in a constructive way. <clears throat> and so I think that this quote kind of hits on that. It's like, it's not fun, is it, Barbie, to be like treated this way? It's like, okay, yeah. And maybe if Barbie was expressing herself to Ken being like, hey, I like you. I don't like you that way. So that's why I don't want to have a sleepover, you know? And it's not that this is my house and this is the girl's night. It's that I just don't feel those feelings for you. I'm really sorry. But she was kind of gaslighting him, right? And she was misleading him and she wasn't telling him the truth because she wanted to keep sweet and be nice and like, well, um, it's a girl thing. Girl, it would have been better if she was honest. Maybe we wouldn't have the Mojo Dojo Casa house. The fact that Ken's existence centers around horses and trucks, as a Montanan, I, oh, I feel so valid. I just love it so much. I love it so much. Here's one that's a little bit niche, but I was like writing it down in the theater. No one rests until this doll is back in the box. Will Ferrell, the Mattel CEO, says this. And I'm like, ugh, what a metaphor. No one rests until a woman who is branched out is back in a nice little category, okay? I'm a woman who defies categories. There's a lot to me. You know, I was in Army ROTC. I love America. I would have loved to go and fight for my country. I love horses and horseback riding. I love to be a girl, honey. But I will cut you down. I'm Machiavelli inside. I am Barbie meets Genghis Khan, all right? And we all are. I'm not special because of that. We are all this. We're all these things. I, I mean, I talk to you guys and you're like, I'm a blacksmith, but I'm also a ballroom dancer. I'm like, what? Like, I'm a vet, but then I go paragliding. Like, how are you doing this? It's crazy. And listen, I'm not saying this, this is maybe part of our post-feminist revolution thing of you have to do all these things. No, you absolutely don't. But I think truly, true feminism is you can do whatever you want. And if you're like, no, I'm a mom and I'm a wife and I stay at home, great. girl, if that's what you like, fucking do it. That's amazing. Whatever is authentic to you is valid. Period, point blank, done. Done. But I think society looks more favorably on things that do fit into that box. The wife, the mom, okay. Why? It's the risk machine. It's the risk machine. A wife and a mom, you can... You can visualize a wife and a mom more than you can visualize um, a blacksmith tap dancer, an army ROTC Barbie, influencer, Montana and big city girl, right? If someone gave you a pencil, you could draw the mommy better than the blacksmith tap dancer. And we as humans, we like predictability. World, our world would be chaos. We would be too exhausted to do anything if we were constantly evaluating, well, what is this person capable of? What, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? We don't do that with our friends. Do you like me? Are you actually my friend? Are you really my friend? Bro, 
Is that really your name? Are you really a cop? Are you really a doctor? Show me, prove it. We can't move through life like this. Our existence in many ways is based on trust and trust is based on predictability, isn't it? And so society wants to put us in these boxes to make us seem less risky. And on some level, I believe that we understand this. And so we keep very sweet and very small. Yeah, I'm a blacksmith, but like, I only make like <laughs> flower, th I don't make anything dangerous. We're constantly tempering our multitudes with these, we're constantly filing down the edges. Oh, I tap dance, but I'm so bad. I'm an influencer, but I'm not that kind of influencer who's really self-centered. The fuck I'm not. Yes, I am. Yes. Because it's fun to be self-centered. I love it. You know? Oh, I wanted to fight for my country, but I was bad at it. I'm a girl in my nails. That actually is true. But I say that to make it, to make, to try to bridge all of these disparate concepts. ROTC, Montana, New York, influencer. Huh? But I'm like, oh, here's my common thread. I'm a girly girl. Let me just stitch all these things together. So someone's like, okay. So she couldn't do the army because she's too girly. And she's bad at being a Montana because she's too girly. You know, it gives them some sort of like general umbrella to put me under. So when you find yourself being self-deprecating or like uh, brushing off a compliment, what common thread are you sensing? Can you pull back enough and be like, why do I do that? How am I trying to make this situation less risky for the person I'm talking to? You might be surprised at what bubbles up. And then if you pull back even more, you're like, holy moly, I do this all over my life. I'm in a constant state of trying to be less risky. Maybe your parents were immigrants and risk is very significant. I mean, very, because they've, they've seen some shit, right? You can't blame them. Maybe you were sick when you were younger and risk, <laughs> you've had your fill, okay? Think about it and think about what it might link to. If you don't know, talk to a therapist. Be like, hey, I really try to dial down my own shine and I wanna understand why so that I can take the power away from it because that leads me into our next quote from the Barbie movie. America Ferrera said, when like all the Barbies are like waking up and they're like, wait, what? She said, by giving voice to the cognitive dissonance required to be a woman under the patriarchy, you've robbed it of its power. Basically, by just showing what's going on and casting a light on all this bullshit, you take the power away. Now, I'm gonna put a video up, I think tomorrow, on solo travel, but I did a reel on this on my Instagram, which you should definitely check out, because I just got back from Mexico and I went alone because I just wanted to chill out. And see, you know, it's funny, I even need to like justify, well, here's why I did. If I said, I went to Mexico with my girlfriends, there would need to be no explanation. It's like, yeah, you went on vacation. I want us as women, in terms of being alone and doing things alone, to get to that place where it needs no justification. I went to Mexico alone. And I want every other woman to be like, oh, I get why. She wants to chill out, she doesn't want to talk to anybody. She needs to relax, explore in her way. But in my reel, I talked about how fear holds us back. Now, I'm not talking about healthy fear, you know, of like, hey, I don't speak the language, what's going on? I'm not talking about healthy fear. I'm talking about that inner critic fear. And she has, she has some good ideas sometimes. And I explore this heavily in the solo travel video. So buckle up for that. But I said, oh, actually, no, I don't think I said this in the reel. I said this to the Shalantaraj. No, I said it in the reel. Okay, I'm sorry. Sometimes I do so much content, I can't remember what I said where. But that fear brain, and you know mine is crystal, crystal. If you, if you pictured that truck stop garbage girl shouting at you, you're never going to get into law school. Hey, you, yeah, you, you're never going to get in. Don't even apply. You're going to look stupid and everyone thinks you're stupid. If, a, if that person with her cigs and her belly chain and her scratchers actually said that to you in real life, you'd be like, shut the fuck. I'm going to call the cops. Who even are you? Why do you know my name and that I applied to law school? You wouldn't be like, oh, really? Do you think so? Well, you're living right. So <laughs> yeah, Methy, I'm going to listen to you. You would never listen to that person. And if you can touch into that crystal brain, whoever yours is, 
and, and like get a really good, clear visual image of who this thing is, you're like, <laughs> okay, okay. You rob it of its power. Monsters live in the dark, don't they? And when you can flip on that light and walk in the light of the truth of like, that's not true. And like after America Ferrera's speech, like we have to be this, we have to be that, and da -da -da, not too much of this. All of us were thinking, that's bullshit. I don't, why do I have to be that? No, 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 I don't want to do that, no. Maybe I don't want to be like soft and wonderful. If I'm a boss in the boardroom, I'm going to be a boss in every other category in my life. People don't like it, they can eat a bag of dicks. It fills us with this righteous rage of how dare you try to put me in that box? How dare you try to tell me what I, how I have to temper and how I have to be so like all of these things at once? How dare you? Now, on the counterpoint, you could say, Shallon, you talk all the time about the middle path. You talk all the time about the middle path. And you, you don't want to be super extreme and you don't want to be all the way on this side. You want to be the Venn overlap of many different things in your life. You do want to be sweet but soft or strong and soft, you know? Well, it's tough, isn't it? And this leads me into the overall point of this video. How to have it all. How do we have it all? How do we do this? Okay. Okay. I talked about this in, in my Barbie reels. So you want the little TLDR, go there. The first thing you need to do in order to have it all is define it. I was in debate in college. A lot of my um, classmates in my major, they, they became trial lawyers. And the first thing a lawyer does is define a term. Define a term, define a, what is what is the client? What is the work? What is the this? You get real granular. What does this actually mean? Because if you don't know what it means, how on earth can you achieve it? You can't change what you don't acknowledge. What is success? I've talked a lot about the covenant of the nerd, the covenant of the nerd, the reason I work so hard, the reason I'm never satisfied, the reason I found being married absolutely intolerable is because I'm a working breed. I'm bred to work. We nerds are, you know? And again, if you have like immigrant parents, and by the way, if you do and you need some career help, check out our girl, Anna Lacomi, L-A-K-O-M-Y, Anna Lacomi on Instagram. She's a shalligator. Met her on a shalligator trip. She's now one of my besties. I adore her, but she specializes, she's a career coach, and she focuses a lot on women um, who have immigrant parents because you guys have a whole different like set of notes <laughs> from your family. A lot of risk aversion or like you have to be super high achieving, but like, hey, don't branch out in other areas. Anyway, the covenant of the nerd, we're meant to work. And so my whole existence was just go, 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 achieve, achieve, achieve. And it's... It's tough because I was never really taught to pull back and define, well, what does success actually mean to you? Because it's like, I can tell you what it means. It means a 4.0 GPA. It means the CEO position. It means the most followers. Like it, it is a, it's a numbers game. Okay. It means top, 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 top. And you might be on the flip side. It's like, no, for me, success is marriage and kids and being a great Jewish wife or a great Muslim mom or whatever it is. But I actually bet you've never paused to even ask yourself, what does success mean to you? What does it mean? And you're, you're saying it means having it all. Now, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. We're all looking at the world through our own filter and all is not an objective term. All actually does mean different things to different people. So for me, when I think about having it all, that doesn't include kids. And when I got really clear about that, when I did like a visualization exercise about my perfect life and I wrote it down, da, 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 kids weren't in it, not even close. People were in it. Friends, you know, my mom, kids weren't. It was stressful. I just, it wasn't in the vision. Yachts were in it, private jets, Monaco, Positano in the summer. That was all in it. And I'm like, oh, okay. I think it's easier to, how, I, how do I say this? There comes, there is a grief 
there is going to be a grief that you feel looking at what doesn't make the all. And I think so many of us are afraid of that grief. We're afraid of the social ripples it's going to have. How do you think it is when I tell people I don't want children? First of all, it's the most brutal thing I've ever done to my mother. I carry a lot of guilt about that, a lot. But I have to remind myself it's my life. It's my life. I can't have a baby to please somebody else. And it's, it's fucking brutal. And it's never going to be like, yay! It, there is always going to be a sadness there. Always. And a sense of failure that I failed her and a sense of guilt. You know, that's always going to be there. But those feelings are not louder than the authenticity of, I just don't want them. Maybe my mind will change. I don't know. But for now, that is really where I'm at. All right? And it took a lot of strength to really look at that. And so when you look at your all, there's going to be things that didn't make the cut. And maybe kids did. And that's easier for you. Okay, you, you know that's going to make your family happy. Maybe a big old high-powered job didn't. And maybe that's difficult for you to look at because you're like, my friends are very career-oriented. My family maybe wants me to be career-oriented. Society wants me to be career-oriented. Sean Lester talks about career all the time. She's always banging on about it. It just isn't for me. I don't have this huge, crazy dream in my heart of someplace I want to work or someplace, something I want to create. I'm fine with a job, you know, a career, a career. But like, I want to go, I want to check out at the end of the day and go home to my kids and go to my husband or go snowboarding. Okay. Okay. Can you accept that that didn't make the cut? And can you get okay with that? Because listen, this is the first step to creating your I have it all life is defining what falls under that category and what doesn't. And you have to give yourself room to change. I mean, for the vast majority of my life, having it all was living in a big city. I mean, that was the foundation of it all. The concept that I could be happy in a small town in, in like the rural suburbs was like, you might as well have said, well, you're gonna be happy living in Guantanamo Bay. It's gonna be great for you. It's a bay, view of the ocean. <laughs> it was like, Insane. It was insane. So things can change, but you're never going to feel like I have it all if you don't give yourself room to let things change and fuse that with the strength and the personal fortitude to say, okay, this didn't make the cut. And I'm going to have to come up with a script to explain to people in my life why I don't want kids, why I don't want a career, why I don't want to leave our small town, why I do. All right, but you cannot sell that. You can't accurately convince people of this. It's not about convincing, but you know what I mean. Until you've gotten good with it yourself. That's the hard part. That's the hard part, okay? Being like, I'm sorry, you didn't make the cut. You're great for other people. You are simply not great for me. Once you do that, you can look and see, okay, what's left here? And you, maybe you looked at your list and you're like, everything is left. Everything is left. I have huge career aspirations, but I also want a husband and kids and a really nice house. And I want to be really fit. Maybe you want it all in a pretty broad definition. But again, I challenge you because I guarantee you there are things that you actually don't care about. Maybe you don't care about travel. Maybe you don't care about being super fashionable. And that sounds small, but it's not. You're like, I just, you know, I have my like classic style. I'm not like a fashionista. Great. Cut that off the list. Get really, really granular. Really zoom into this. Be like, there are things that just don't matter. I don't need to cook a bunch. I don't, I don't, I don't cook. I don't need to throw over the top parties. I don't like to host. Great. Take these off the list. Take these off the list. Because when you see women who are doing these things, we are conditioned to be like, what does this say about me? What does this say about me? I'm comparing myself. And let's be honest, we as women do these things so that women compare themselves and they feel deficient and boosts us up. Hey man, hate the game, not the player. But when you can be like, oh yeah, I'm, I love that she hosts that Barbie party. I'm not going to do it. I, I'm not a host. I don't like to host. Know thyself, Barbie girl. Know thyself. It's the first step. Because then when you have whittled this down to your list of what truly matters to you, then you can start organizing by priority. 
We look at women who we think have it all. And in my reel, I use the example of Rihanna. Rihanna has it all. She's got this amazing boyfriend, kids. She's, you know, such a talented artist. She's like a chart topper. She's got Fenty. She performed the Super Bowl. She hosted the Met Gala. She did not do all these things at the same time. No, she didn't. No, she didn't. She's not touring while eight months pregnant. She's not making new music while launching Fenty. You know, she had a season for the music and then the season for Fenty and then a season for Savage, that clothing line, and then the season for kids. And then who knows what's next? Every successful woman, nay, every successful man, because men are fantastic at doing this, and I'll touch on that in a minute. They have, they block schedule. This is my season for career, okay? And I'm gonna run, 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 run. And then when I get to a place where I'm like, okay, I'm director level, now, kids, 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 kids. And then when they're kind of good, run, run, run career-wise. Or we renovate the house, and then we start traveling when we're empty nesters. If you are a smart woman, that's how you live your life. We're not taught to have a five-year plan. I mean, kind of, kind of. But those five-year plans, we think it has to include everything. Well, I have to be striving for my career while raising my kids, while being this amazing wife. Girl, something's got to give. Something's got to give. And you know what usually gives? Your body or your relationship. Your body or your relationship. We go where the alarms are. And that's work because you can get fired and you need the money. And that's kids because God knows they never shut up. Your body, you'll deal with it tomorrow. I don't, mommy doesn't need a shower. Mommy doesn't need to go on her run. Mommy doesn't need to do this. And take kids out of the equation. Take kids out, out of the equation. I'm so tired. I didn't have time to go to the gym. I had to be out late for happy hour with the boss people and everything last night. We know this. We know that relationships suffer. Look at the divorce rate after kids are introduced into a relationship. It's not great. And you know, I think Barbie represented this concept that you can have it all, but sacrifices need to be made in the last scene where she's got Birkenstocks on, right? I mean, she decides to become real Barbie. Sorry for the spoilers. And it's like, she's got to swap her footwear. Sacrifices have to be made. If you want to be a woman moving through the world, you got to pick some sensible shoes at some point. And that's, that to me is so true. Like you can have these things that you want, but you're gonna have to make sacrifices. You will. Ask any successful woman who's doing it all, be like, what sacrifices have you made? Oh, she'll be like, sit down. I have, I, I have a whiteboard. Would you like to know? And if for nothing else, she's like, I, I really do it all. I'm a high powered woman, but I have kids. You know what she's gonna say? I have a lot of guilt. I, I can't be there for every recital. I can't be there for every you know, school pickup. I, I, and I feel guilty about that. I wonder if I'm missing out and are the girls getting enough time with me and whatever it is. Look that in the face and that's going to give you a more realistic system of making these priorities and making these lists and, and logistically figuring out, okay, how do I do it? How do I have it all? It doesn't actually just magically happen. So you have to be judicious with what your priority is and understand that you can have it all. You cannot have it all at the exact same time. Not at the same pace, you can't. I want you to read a book called Essentialism. We did it as a show literature book club like a while ago. We should, we should revisit it. I love it on audiobook because the guy's British and I'm just like, oh yes, take me away. But he talks about exactly this and how the word priorities is bullshit. Priority, singular, singular. What's your priority? When you can set that, Things fall into a better categorization system. I'm sorry, my priority this week is finishing my book. Everything else comes second. My friend has an emergency. I'm sorry, my priority is the book. I have to be a PTA mom. I'm sorry, my priority is the book. It requires no. Which is why we don't like to do this. Blech. We like to say yes because we're conditioned to say yes. Go give your weird Uncle Marty a hug. He bought you that rabbit costume. Go give him a hug. I don't want to give him a hug. He smells like jerky. I don't want to hug him. But that's what we're taught to do. No isn't really an option. Ugh, I'll just give this guy a blowjob. He'll go to bed and then I can leave. Right? So how on earth are we supposed to expect ourselves to say all these no's all the time when we're, when we're yes men? But if we can have a priority 
that we can default to, ooh, I'm so sorry, I would love to drive you to the airport at four in the morning, but I gotta work on the book. I'm sorry, when we can blame, blame something, it makes it a little bit easier to say no because we have a reason. We're not just being a shitty friend, a bad daughter. I have a reason. I'm not just being a bitch on this date that I can't stay out with you until 2 a.m. doing shots. I have a workout at 7 a.m. I'm training for a marathon. That's my priority right now. I'm mad about it. I'm mad. And like I said, men are absolutely conditioned to do this. Absolutely. When I was in New York, guys who didn't even seem that driven, oh, they were a shark. Guys were like, oh, they're just like some drunken Goldman Sachs guy. No, 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 no. They were like, I'm working my ass off from 22 to 28. And then at 28, I'll choose a wife and then we'll have kids. And then at 31, we're gonna move out to the suburbs in Greenwich. I'm gonna commute into the city, probably gonna have a mistress. I'm gonna be like VP level at Goldman. And then around 40, I'm gonna start my own hedge fund. Like they have this shit mapped out. And until they're at the wife season, you could be a Victoria's Secret model sitting on their face. And they're like, no thanks. Did you, have you not experienced this? Have we not all seen this with guys that we date? Like, oh, I'm, I don't wanna get married. I'm not ready for this. And then like three months later, it's like, what the fuck? Who, he's all coupled up. Yeah, season changed. He got that promotion. He moved into his own place. He paid off his student loans. Season number two is starting. They recognize this block prioritization because society doesn't expect them to be multitudes. Who fucking cares what society expects? Nothing in my entire life, nothing that I have achieved was something somebody expected. I can't tell you how many people were like, I wouldn't do that if I were you. You can't do that. That's why I'm doing it. Don't get that twisted, not ever. I am very aware that you wouldn't do this. Thank you. Do you know how hard it is to write a book? You're just gonna become a YouTuber? What, like it's hard? Yeah, I am. You're not having kids? No, I'm not. And if you have a problem with that, sounds like a personal. This is not my issue. And that's tough. But there's so much freedom in hate. There's so much freedom in hate. Hate is so underrated. It's such a beautiful thing. When people don't like you, oh, these are the moments that make life worth living. Because again, it kicks up that crystal. It's like, how fucking dare you tell me how I am supposed to live my life? I'm supposed to have a kid? Are you gonna babysit all the time? Are you gonna be able to live in nanny? Then shut up. Are you gonna, are you gonna breastfeed? Because these nipples are teeny tiny and perfect. No thanks. How dare you tell me what's expected of me in my own life? How dare you? That righteous fury bubbles up. And we look at these people trying to put us back in the box, trying to tell us what to do. And it's like, I'm so sorry. What? And then our life gets to break open. And it's painful. That's why it's called growing pains. Our life gets to be lived for us and what we want. And that's what feminism is. And to me, that's Barbie. And it really stood out to me at the very beginning of the movie when, you know, the narrator's like, little girls only had dollies to play mommy with. That's all they could do. Oh, it's a tea party and we're changing the dolly. And she's like, and then Barbie came along and Barbie had jobs. And I was like, whoa, I've never thought about that because I never lived before Barbie, you know? Of course Barbie had jobs. She had a million jobs, a million outfits, a million looks. I mean, she could change, I mean, she was an ice dancer and then she's a pilot, you know, she's a million things from one day to the next. And it's like, well, yeah. It never really occurred to me until that scene that, that, that there was a life before Barbie, you know? Before choices, like we know it. But then to really see it, it's like, oh, wow, how crazy. But remember, like I said about representation, there are paths you are meant to walk that no one else has. That you don't, no one that you may know, 
that isn't modeled for you, fuck it. How weak are you that you, that you need this path to be modeled? No, you're not weak at all. You're strong. You, girl, are a pioneer. You're a pioneer. And maybe that path is I'm going to be the first Muslim girl in my family not to get married and move out anyway. I don't need to live at home. I'm a pioneer. Is there anyone else in my family who's doing this? Is there the Muslim Barbie who doesn't live with her parents anymore? No, I don't need there to be. All I need to see is this feeling inside of me that is like, you're doing good. This makes sense for you. And you feel that and you align to that by ironically tapping into the crystal who's like, don't do that. And you're like, who the fuck are you? That doesn't feel good. Listening to this truck stop weirdo doesn't feel good. It feels small. It feels obedient. What does it feel like when you stand up straight? Does that feel different? Does that feel better? I bet it does. Does it feel scarier? Yes. Yes. Sometimes that, that feeling, don't be like, this is fear. I'm a weirdo. You're a pioneer. You're landing on the moon. You're Sacagawea. Oh, reminds me about something. I want to know your thoughts on the Barbie movie. I could talk about Barbie forever. I really love this movie. Go see it. See it with your mom. See it with your friends. See it with your sister. But definitely, definitely see it. I think it's great. I just love it. <sighs> and at the worst case, you get to look at Ryan Gosling and Margot Robbie for like two hours. They're beautiful. It's fantastic. All right, Shalligators, let me know your thoughts. I hope some incels find this video. Can you imagine? Oh, I love it when the red pill losers come here. But, whoa. Like, Please witness and contribute to the making of a female orgasm in real life. Then come talk to us. All right, I'll see you later, Shalligators. Bye, Barbie!